The following program contains elements that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had to stab her. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day and I can't believe it. It's like a big dream. I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. I'd rather kill myself than get locked up. I'll try not to kill anybody else. On New Year's Eve in 1980, Karen Potak is walking alone at night on the streets of St. Paul, Minnesota, when she's assaulted by a man wielding a tire iron. He rapes her and beats her so badly that first responders to the scene think her face has been slashed with a knife. It's after this attack that the police receive the first call. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to Pierce Butler Road, Mollenberg Manufacturing Company, Machine Shop. Please, there's an ambulance too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? Just hurry, she's laying on the ground in the back by the, by the railroad tracks, by the engine. Hurry. What, what's the address? I don't know. Who are you? Unbeknownst to police, the voice belongs to 37-year-old janitor Paul Michael Stefani. Stefani grew up in Austin, Minnesota. His stepfather worked as a meatpacker, and his mother stayed at home. Although his family was religious and had a good reputation in their community, Stefani had always had a violent streak, and he was even once convicted of aggravated assault. They find Potak's body in a snowbank, precisely where Stefani said it would be. She somehow manages to survive the brutal attack, but her injuries leave her permanently disabled. A year later, the police receive another call. Oh, you, f you find me? I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. St. Paul police find a woman's dead body near the freeway. She's been stabbed 61 times with an ice pick. Upon inspecting the body, Detectives find a locker key that leads them to a St. Paul bus station. Inside the locker, they find items belonging to 18-year-old Kimberly Compton. She had arrived only a few hours before her murder in St. Paul from the small town of Pepin, Wisconsin, hoping to start a new life. On the night of her murder, she stops to eat at a diner where she meets Stefani. He offers to show her around the city, but instead drives her to a secluded area near a river where he ends her life. A couple of days after Compton's murder, Stefani calls again. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had to stab her. The police are able to trace the calls, once to a bar near the bus station and once to a phone booth. Unfortunately, the killer is nowhere to be found in either location by the time police arrive. Police release the phone calls to the public, hoping that someone will recognize the killer. However, the detectives receive few promising leads in the case and make no arrests. The media dubs Stefani the weepy-voiced killer. On July 21st, 1982, roughly a year after Compton's murder, Stefani drowns a Roseville, Minnesota resident named Kathleen Greening in a tub in her home. A couple of months later, the body of 40-year-old Barbara Simons is discovered near Riverbank in Minneapolis. She has more than 100 stab wounds, but detectives are unable to find any DNA evidence pointing to the identity of the killer. Once again, the police receive a call. This time, Stefani seems more hysterical than ever. Fire emergency. Please don't talk to this person. I'm sorry, I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one. Oh my God, I don't know what you're mad at I'm sick. I'm going to kill myself, I think. Where are you? I'm just going to, if somebody dies with a red kid on it's me, I killed both of you. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to help it. Calm down, calm down. A waitress at a local bar called the Hexagon tells police that she saw Simons leaving with a man on the night she was murdered. 
The waitress is shown hundreds of mugshots in the police database, and she identifies Paul Stefani as the man she saw. Stefani becomes the prime suspect in the case, and police begin to track him. On August 21st, 1982, Stefani takes a drive to Minneapolis' red light district, and the police surveillance team loses track of his vehicle. While they scramble to try and find him again, he picks up a prostitute named Denise Williams. Stefani drives to his apartment where he pays Williams for sex. He then offers her a free ride back to the city. While sitting in the passenger seat, Williams begins to notice that Stefani is following an unusual route. Instead of taking the highway, he's driving down dark, deserted roads. He tells Williams that he's taking a shortcut, but she begins to sense something is wrong. Stefani pulls into a dead-end road and proceeds to stab Williams with a screwdriver. Williams manages to grab a glass bottle and hits Stefani in the head, causing him to bleed profusely. She tries to jump out of the car, but Stefani relentlessly continues his attack. At this point, they are both soaked in blood and Williams is screaming for help. Her screams are heard by a nearby resident who runs to her aid. Stefani flees in his car. Denise Williams ends up with 15 puncture wounds, but survives. Stefani calls police, but instead of confessing his crime, he asks for an ambulance. Responders find Stefani in his apartment with severe cuts to his face and arms. Police quickly realize that he was likely Williams' attacker. Williams identifies Stefani's mugshot and police arrest him. He is charged with attempted murder for his attack on her, and police also charge him with the murder of Barbara Simons. During the trial, Stefani's calls are used as evidence. His sister and his ex-wife testify that they believe the voice belongs to him and he is convicted to 40 years behind bars. Prosecutors choose not to pursue charges for the murder of Kimberly Compton and the attack on Karen Potek. It isn't until 20 years later that Stefani finally confesses to these crimes while in prison. He also confesses to drowning Kathleen Greening in 1982 a crime which police had never linked him to. Stefani had been recently diagnosed with terminal cancer, and he told the authorities he wanted to come clean before it was too late. The reason Paul Stefani murdered these women remains a mystery. Even more mysterious is why he placed the calls to the police that eventually aided his conviction. What do you think? Was Stefani remorseful for the crimes he committed and placing the calls as a cry for help? Was he boasting, or was he just desperate for attention? Let me know what you think in the comments.